Brett Favre's business partner has pleaded guilty for his role in a welfare scandal. Plus, Canada's women's soccer team was caught spying on New Zealand, a Winter Olympics host has been named, and hockey could be coming back to Phoenix. It's Thursday, July 25th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The NBA announced that, quote, Warner Bros. Discovery's most recent proposal did not match the terms of Amazon Prime Video's offer, and therefore we have entered into a long-term arrangement with Amazon. On Monday, Warner Bros. Discovery submitted a $1.8 billion per year proposal to match Amazon's C package proposal. FOS sources indicate this saga will likely move to litigation. Meanwhile, the NBA went ahead and announced 11-year media deals with Disney, NBC, and Amazon, which are reportedly worth $77 billion in total. French authorities arrested a Russian man at his Paris apartment on Tuesday, alleging that he planned to destabilize the Olympic Games. The man was charged with conducting intelligence work on behest of a foreign power with the intent to provoke hostilities in France. Those crimes could come with a 30-year sentence. Coco Goff has been named the female flag bearer for the U.S. in Friday's Olympic opening ceremony. The 20-year-old will join LeBron James in carrying the flag. She is the first U.S. tennis player to have the honor. Salt Lake City has been named the host city for the 2034 Winter Olympics. The city was the lone contender for 2034. Climate change and the high cost of hosting have made other potential hosts reconsider. The 2026 Winter Games will be in Milan, and the French Alps received tentative approval to host in 2030. The Rose Bowl is requesting that it keep its traditional January 1st date as the college football playoff expands. Though the CFP is expanding to 12 teams, Rose Bowl organizers are making the case that their brand is tied to its playing date in a way that no other bowl game is. And Jake Van Landingham, the founder of drug company Prevacus, pleaded guilty to a single count of wire fraud, a charge that can bring a prison sentence of up to 20 years. The largest investor in Prevacus is Hall of Fame quarterback Brett Favre, who is facing legal challenges from multiple sides. Prevacus illegally received $2 million in federal welfare funds. A guilty plea could put Brett Favre in legal hot water. Joining me now to discuss is front office sports senior reporter AJ Perez. Welcome, AJ. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Great to have you. So the guilty plea was not by Favre himself. So who pleaded guilty and to what? Yeah, Jake Van Landingham was the founder of a company called Prevacus. Uh, Now, Prevacus was a kind of a pharma startup. They were developing two concussion-related drugs. Um, Neither went to market. Neither really got very far. There was some testing that we had to do some reporting on a couple of years ago. Um, That got a testing on dogs and and also uh, flight football players, of all things. Uh, And uh, this Jake Van Lemingham was the was the um, was the first to you know start of the company. Brett Favre was a was a spokesperson and also the largest single uh, the largest individual shareholder of Prevacus. And uh, we saw over the last couple, the last two or three years, we've seen a lot of text messages from Jake Van Landingham and, and, and Brett Favre as they're trying to get funding for Prevacus. And, uh, and uh, basically now, uh, today, uh, uh, Jake Van Landingham took a plea deal um, for, for wire fraud is, and uh, he faces up 20 years in prison, uh, a couple hundred thousand dollar fine potentially. Um, but really, it's, it's about this is the first person who there's been several people. This is a seventh person indicted by the federal authorities uh, for the for the for, for the TANF scandal. Um, and Favre had contact with, with a lot of those people. But this is the first one kind of at Favre's level or kind of wasn't a, wasn't above this chain. It was kind of right there alongside of him as they were kind of getting trying to get more funding. Favre, again, has not been charged criminally and he has. Uh, and he has denied wrongdoing and he, yeah, there's, you know, while this, while I have a quote in my story from a lawyer saying that it's, it, 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 what it could mean for Favre, it's still, it's still, uh, you know, we, we still don't know whether he will be indicted. Yeah. I mean, that's my next question is, yeah, what does this mean for Favre? Is there any indication one way or another on if, if he could be next? Yeah, we have a, actually I'm working on a story on this, uh, on the statute of limitations and how much time is actually left. Uh, to indict him uh, for Favre, and also it's not just Favre; it's also a former governor Phil Bryant, who was who who actually he, he did get this investigation going by tipping off the state auditor way back in uh, 2019, um, and that started this investigation and led to all these charges. 
Um, so there's like, there's always been two big fish. And since I started covering this more than two years ago, you know, the big fish is one is Brett Favre, obviously Hall of Fame quarterback, a uh, very you know, legendary dude there down there in Mississippi. And number two is former governor Phil Bryant. Now I, uh, you know, there's, Unlike Favre, uh, Favre is a defendant, and so is Jake Van Lanningham in the lawsuit filed by the Mississippi Welfare uh, Department to re- to over $90 million in misspent funds. Uh, uh, Governor Bryant is not a, a, is not a defendant, unlike uh, Van Lanningham and, and, and Brett Favre in that case. You know, there's, you know, there, the culpability there is like you could, you could go, you know, it's, he's a very major player. And I think uh, Mississippi Today has done a lot of reporting on, on Brian's connection. We've kind of focused since we're a sports outlet on Favre and really either, whether either will ever be indicted, um, time's running out for both really. Yeah. And right. So this is not the only Mississippi welfare money scandal that Favre is involved in. There's also the one, you know, connected to um, the University of Southern Miss building a volleyball court using welfare yes. funds um these certainly seem like they're connected like are, is this all yeah. one case or um it, 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 it would the previous money is is the last part of kind of far's connection to this and it goes back until really it kind of and then now prosecutors could charge could 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 actually um kind of the other there's five million dollars for the volleyball court at us and his alma mater it, he was he wanted to build a this arena there right before his daughter started attending and playing volleyball there so that was five million that went to the, the usm athletic foundation um then there was another 1.1 million dollars for for psas and speeches he only recorded like a 20 second spot that went right to Favre. so that was the only money that went to Favre. now both of those you could argue what people i've been talking to they, they may not be able to federal you know the 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 statute of limitations may have already run out on those but Previcus is still going for at least several more weeks um, if, if, you, if you use the five-year standard. A lot of uh, welfare money headed to things connected to Brett Favre uh, for him to not, you know, be involved in a pretty major way here. Um, and especially because he seems to be the only link to, to all these different things. Is he, does he have a case here? Is he making claims beyond I'm, I'm innocent um, that can explain how he's connected to all this and yet not guilty? Yeah, he through this entire time, you know, even when this kind of all came out, and this really kind of started coming out in 2020, uh, middle of, two, uh, that's when he first got connected to the, for, for like the speeches, before we knew about the volleyball, before we knew about Previcus, uh, he's always maintained he didn't know the funds were coming from, uh, not, you know, even from the welfare agency, he just says state funds. You know, there is now the the state in the lawsuit has said he's he, he knew at some point he knew the funds were coming from the Mississippi Department of Human Services, which is the welfare department. They were funneled through this nonprofit and then to Favre for the for the one point one million dollars for the for the PSAs and speeches, the five million dollars that went to the USM and then the two around two million dollars that went to Prevacus. They all kind of use the same system. Now, at some point. You know, there looks if you and you, this you have to kind of without any you know, without uh you know without any charges. It's kind of have to be careful, but you there. But we've done we we've, we've done reporting in the past going back a couple of years saying that Farb at some point knew that it was coming from welfare funds, or at least from the welfare department. And the NDHS case after our, our reporting came out said the same thing. So uh so that so you know at some point he knew. Now did he know back for the for, for the for back in 2017 for the PSA speech? Did he know? Maybe not. But eventually, this all went into 2019, late 2019, and this is this is this is the Prevacus part, which is which is Jake's company. That's when you know I that, that's when a lot of observers uh, and a lot of the court documents kind of seem to spell out that Favre had some understanding that it was coming from welfare money. Now, he, maybe did you know it was federal TANF dollars? Now, TANF dollars are very block grants to states, um, and they're not uh, they're not very well policed for anything. You know, these the, the federal government just gives these states these grants. And they can do, you know, they're supposed, most states use them the right way. Um, there's a few states that didn't, uh, Mississippi being one of them. Um, you know, why, why a football player had access or was connected to $8 million that's supposed to go to the poorest people in, and in Mississippi, the, po- the poorest state in, 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 in the U.S. That's, that's, a, that's another question about oversight that uh, I think, uh, I still don't think Mississippi has got a good handle on. All right. <laughs> a lot going on. And just to put it all together, he, if he's going to get charged for any or all of this, that has to happen in the next few weeks, it sounds like, or else the statute of limitations is over. Yeah, yeah. We'll have a story coming out on that. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, but there's also, uh, I can't, I don't want to, 
break too much news uh, yet until I'll, I'll be back on for the next story. But there's also there's an FBI, there, there's an FBI 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 interview that he did that will kind of pushes it back some more. So if not that we have no we have no information that he lied in, to federal investigators. Um, but we saw Yasiel Puig, who's been in the news for a little bit for for his plea deal for the same charge uh, that Far or anybody else in this case could could face for lying to the FBI. Um, but it's 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 probably you know I, it'd be kind of it'd be odd for the feds just to charge that. So anyway, gotcha. Very interesting stuff. Keep us surprised. Hey, Perez, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me on. The Olympics are only just getting started and we already have a scandal. Joining me now to discuss is front office sports breaking news and enterprise reporter Alex Schiffer. Welcome, Alex. What's going on, Owen? How you doing, man? I'm I'm great. Yeah, we, we live in exciting times, um, especially especially when spies are involved. So um, why did two coaches from Canada's women's soccer team get sent home? Technically, it's an analyst and a assistant coach. Um, but if you want to count the head coach uh, sitting out tomorrow's game against New Zealand, I guess it still works out. Um, New Zealand was practicing the other day and they saw a drone flying above practice, which obviously raises suspicion in natural, uh, natural times. And they ceased practice. They alerted the police. The police found the operator of the drone, who was a analyst for the Canadian women's soccer team. They confiscated the drone and other stuff from his room. And they found that he had videotaped or was it videotaping practice for that day and had also done it two days earlier and had insight into their game and he is in jail now. He might get a 45,000 euro fine. It looks like it's going to be there eight months. And yes, he has also been dismissed from the games, as has an assistant coach who he seemed to have reported it to. The coach w- was brought in by the police and was exonerated. So that's kind of the, her role in all this is kind of an interesting, uh, there's still some gray area there, but that is the long and short of how we got here. Yeah. And my understanding was the, the drone operator here was suspended, but the, but they're actually like they have an eight month suspension, but they're actually like in, in jail. Yeah. The, the drone operator was brought into custody for flying a aircraft in a prohibitive zone. And he is. Yeah. If that, which in France, according to their laws, it is up to a year in prison. Uh, I court system is you're guilty until proven innocent which is the opposite obviously of here in the united states but uh but yeah and then he had it looked like he was he had got an eight-month sentence that was sort of negotiated so this all went down really quick yeah and shout out to your high school history teacher so um brother mike (laughs) yeah i was gonna say i'm surprised they thought this would work drones are fairly conspicuous but apparently he had gotten away with it a couple days earlier so um and the head coach sitting out the game against new zealand is that like a self-imposed penalty of saying, you know, like we understand we did something wrong, so I'm going to take myself out of the situation too? It appears so. You know, she said that this all happened without her knowing. Uh, I question that a little bit, Owen. You know, uh, I, I mean, look in the United States when it comes to college scandals or whatever, you know, head coaches are ultimately responsible for the actions of their assistants. So, may, again, this is an international thing, but I'm still thinking kind of domestically, I guess. Um but I'm, I'm really curious to see what happens with, with her and, honestly, the rest of her staff just because Canada women's soccer has been on the rise the past few years. They won gold in, in Tokyo, and they're eighth in the FIBA rankings right now, or excuse me, FIBA, FIFA rankings right now. And they were looked at as a heavy favorite to potentially reclaim that gold medal. Has she coached her last game? Has she come back at some point in the tournament? You know, uh, there's a lot of weird optics here. It kind of reminds me, so we talked about the Mets off air, you know, Carlos Beltran was involved in the Astro sign stealing scandal and, and they couldn't have him managed because they thought the optics would be bad. I, that's what I was kind of thinking about with some of this. Like, do we really see her come back at some point with, uh, at least in the context of the Olympics? Uh, I'm skeptical. Yeah, and it's kind of, there, there's no, no real good resolution here. I mean, what if New Zealand and Canada play? And it, it just seems like, Canada's ready for everything New Zealand throws at them. Is that just because they're the better team or, or is it because they already have this information, um, you know, gotten through, through unscrupulous means. So yeah, it's, it's kind of an ugly start. Um, at least in this one corner of the games. Yeah, no, without question. I, uh, I'm curious to see, does the match get chippy at all tomorrow? And, and to your point, just 
if Canada goes on to get another gold medal, does this come with an asterisk? I mean, what's how's the perception going to be of all this? I mean, what if they have to beat a lot of top teams on their way there? You know, can they really get because it's become some kind of a distraction of some sorts? Um, I, I think that they kind of just became a, a team to watch that maybe people weren't thinking about from a big picture total Olympic game standard um, compared to some others, but this probably moves them up in the, uh, in the storytelling and uh, uh, question ranking of, of what happens with all this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we already got some intrigue, um, you know, right at the outset of the games. Alex Schiffer, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. I got to learn if you can bet over-unders on a rest before the uh, Olympics start. <laughs> if that gets added to the lines now. If you can dream it, you can bet on it. So, yeah, I think so. The Oakland A's signed their first-round draft choice, Nick Kurtz, to a $7 million deal. That's actually a little under the $8.4 million slot value afforded to them by having the fourth overall pick. Still, that is more than any A's hitter and all but two pitchers are making this year because this team is much more interested in not spending money than they are in winning baseball games. Despite high draft picks offering potentially enormous bang for your buck because they can turn into star players making league minimum salaries, A's owner John Fisher has been known to wince at the price tag. Referring to how the team tore apart a division-winning team led by young stars a few years ago, Fisher said, quote, We ended up with a much higher draft pick, and, you know, it's an opportunity, but it's an expensive opportunity to sign high draft picks. Fisher has largely avoided such expenses on this year's roster. The team's $63 million payroll features only eight players making over $1 million. Moneyball, where you try to find good value for less money, is now what other teams do. The A's are fully focused on the less money part with promises that things will be different when they finally get to Las Vegas. Suns and Mercury owner Matt Ishbia might be adding another team to his portfolio sooner rather than later. Writing off the success of WNBA All-Star Weekend at Phoenix's Footprint Center, Ishbia teased the potential to bring a hockey team back to the desert, saying, quote, If I can help bring hockey back, I'll look at that. It's a four-sport town. I'm disappointed we don't have a hockey team. For a long time, Arizona has been a four-sport town, but next year, the Coyotes, who played at Arizona State University this past season, will be rebranded and relocated as the Utah Hockey Club. The relocation deal closed in April for $1 billion. Previous Coyotes owner Alex Murillo retained rights to the Coyotes' name during the sale and had planned to bring back the team within the next five years. However, he has since walked away from his ownership position after plans for a new arena in northern Phoenix fell through. Ishbia said to reporters that he understands what happened and that he is going to try to fix that one day. With an arena and better local relations than Morello had, in a market the NHL is eager to return to, Ishbia has a strong shot to make it work. This season, Shohei Otani has been in the spotlight as much for his life off the field as his superstar level playing. Now the latest number on his endorsement deals has been revealed to the public, and it reaches nine figures. Last summer, when Otani left the Angels of Anaheim for the neighboring L.A. Dodgers, he signed a 10-year deal worth $700 million, the largest contract in sports history. However, he elected to defer most of the payment until 2034 and onwards. The reigning AL MVP will only be collecting $2 million per season for the next 10 years, at which point the remaining $680 million on the deal starts to kick in at a whopping $68 million per season. Otani's robust endorsement deals are what permitted him to sign this unique contract to begin with, It was estimated earlier this year that those deals would add up to around $65 million. According to The Athletic, that number is now believed to eclipse $100 million. It pays to be an international icon. That's it for today. Leave us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts and hit the like button if you aren't watching on YouTube. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.